You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Case. We will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Kirsty Webb. Kirsty is an APMP fellow with more than 30 years of experience in all facets of business development and marketing services. Kirsty is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at ARS Elliott Remediation. Kirsty has twice been the volunteer chair of APMP and was also instrumental in APMP's certification program by pushing for an APMP body of knowledge. Kirsty also serves as a counselor with the East Tennessee Procurement Technical Assistance Center. She achieved APMP certification at the foundation level and holds a bachelor's degree and an MBA at the University of Phoenix. Welcome, Kirsty, to Scribble Talk. Great to have us with you. Happy Thank you very us. much. Um, so we're going to start out with a little bit of your early beginnings, Kirsty. Where were you born and where did you go to school? I was born in a very small town in Western Maryland called Cumberland. Um, and I ultimately went to school at West Virginia University, but I didn't finish my, uh, grad, my undergraduate degree there. Instead, I began working in this industry uh, and didn't finish my degree until about 13 years later at University of Phoenix. Oh, wow. Very interesting. Um, And did you go to high school in the Maryland area? I did, a a school called Allegheny High School. Very fun. And what about your first job? Oh, geez. My first job actually (laughs) was a lifeguard. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, I used to Um, lifeguard at our summer, uh, at our pool in the summers. Oh, very nice. So when did you first enter the proposal industry? In 1986. Wow. Um, And so how did that go? Um, It was very interesting. I was taking a graduate level Old English course at West Virginia, and I was the only undergrad and um, the only one somehow managing to get an A in the course. Uh, Come to find out later, it's because of where I grew up. But my professor came to me and inquired if I'd be interested in applying for a summer job in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. So I interviewed for this job called a proofreader editor. And as I continue to this day to tell everybody, I hate reading and I hate writing. So I am applying for a proofreader editor job. Uh, It was supposed to be a summer job. And about six, eight weeks into the job, uh, the company asked me to stay full time. And at 21 years old, not often that that can happen. So I said yes. And at that time, there were no real dedicated proposal departments. And my um, immediate boss came to me oh, I guess probably six, eight months later and said, I have a vision. I'm going to create something called a business development group, and I want you to be my first business development specialist. And my usual response to things is, sure, what's that? <laughs> And that's where it started. I went through uh, high silver proposal training. When Shipley came along, I went through Shipley training and began in this industry when it was very, very young. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, So it sounds like you had some very interesting beginnings and kind of fell into it like a lot of us do. Um, What are some of the other major highlights of your career? Oh, uh, there are numerous ones. Um, One of the first ones is what it feels like to win. Um, That first proposal, when you understand what it means to put all that effort in. And back then, there was this was a time where we didn't have desktop publishing. So the effort to really produce a proposal um, was full court press. You were dealing with print shops. Um, You had to go through four color process print. And the only thing you printed in color were the covers. Uh, Cut and paste was exactly that. You had an X-Acto blade and glue, and you cut and paste out hand-drawn graphics into your documents for copying. Um, So when you win that first proposal, it's a pretty amazing feeling. Um, On the other side of it, losing that first one is also, um, but it's also where I started realizing uh, the lessons learned that can be applied. And then, oh gosh, over the years, the major milestones, probably the more significant ones are where I'm able to see 
how my mentoring has helped others continue in the industry. I made my first ever hire at that first company. And to this day, she is still involved in proposals and she's actually still with that same company. And those are some of the biggest achievements I appreciate. Oh, that's great. You've been able to see so much and uh, really influence others as well. Um, do you have a most memorable proposal or capture effort? Oh, hmm. depends on what you mean by memorable. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the, um, hmm, let's see, I'm trying to think. There were so many different ones that I've worked on. One was the fact that when, when it was all said and done, the produced um, copies encompassed 18 three-inch binder boxes. And if you can imagine 12 empty three-inch binders and coming in a box, how big those boxes are, we had 18 of them. And this was not all that long ago. It was back in mid-2000s. Wow. Um, that effort also entailed our first real electronic upload into a system. And it was into a database that you're only allowed to upload 10 documents at a time, each no more than 10 megabyte in size. Oh. And we had over 100. And when I told the proposal team, we had to allocate three full business days in order for me to upload. Uh, you wouldn't believe the backlash I got. We don't have that time. And uh, I said, well, you don't have a choice because if we don't finish the upload by the due date and time, we get thrown out. And I can already tell you it's going to take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to upload a single document. Mm. And at that point, they listened and I proceeded to upload 10 documents, stand up from my desk, walk away from my keyboard and leave my office, lock the door so that the 10 documents would load without anyone touching the computer. <laughs> and I go back in and load 10 more. Um, I think some of the more memorable ones now are coming where I am today. I have the fortune of serving in a uh, senior leadership role with a, what's called a small business association or small business agency, uh, 8A Alaska Native Corporation. And in this position, we are often um, given an opportunity to convince a customer to come to us directly. And I've actually had three significant efforts where it's been initiating the contact with those customers, demonstrating to them what our capabilities are, and then seeing those actually come to fruition. Uh, with my most recent one actually coming just last week. Wow, very interesting stuff. Wow, uh, Kirsty. So in, in addition to taking lots of different roles, Kirsty, I also noted that you also have been part of a very interesting different types of industries as well, Kirsty. Um, uh, that is very true. <laughs> so can you share some of it, if there is any interesting experience of across all the different industries that you've been part of, Kirsty? I did found like a nuclear manufacturing. It's all fascinating for me. If you can share some of the experience around it, Kirsty, and how things are similar, dissimilar across the different things. Absolutely. So my first company was a defense contractor. Uh, the term Beltway Bandit uh, was deemed for a number of companies that served the Department of Defense that were literally right around the Beltway area in Washington, D.C. Um, from there, I actually uh, did a short period with a company that um, created emergency 911 and computer-aided dispatch systems. Mm -hmm. Knowing nothing about how you actually sell computer systems and software, um, that was an eye-opener to learn that process. And in my short time there, I uh, really learned how to develop estimates around equipment. Um, and then one day I was offered an opportunity to go interview for a company called British Nuclear Fuels. Um, I went into the job interview and the opening line was, yes, we do nuclear waste management. And I was like, hmm, I think I need to go do a little research what that means. Um, but that's really what got me in. And, and I've pretty much been consistent in that industry um, since 1991 when I took that job. But through my career, I've had the fortune of uh, serving in a consulting capacity with companies that wanted to branch out some small businesses, one in particular, 
um, decided he wanted to look at what it meant to be in manufacturing. And so I got exposed to the advanced manufacturing sector, clean energy, um, advanced technologies like 3D printing, although now it's not that advanced for most of us. Um, but when I started down that path, 3D printers weren't as, as known as they are today. Um, I've worked with anti-terrorism and force protection. I have worked with your standard construction and architect and engineer firms. So it's, it's a matter of recognizing that for the federal side of things here in the U.S., um, each agency does operate differently, but there's a set, set, set standard for how those RFPs look. So you pretty much know which sections you have to go to to figure out what you have to respond to. The commercial sector is very different. Um, mm -hmm. What we have found is while the process you apply is still the same, it's mm -hmm. often on a much more accelerated schedule, but they're also more amenable to having conversations before you submit. And now in this world that I'm in with the 8A, mm -hmm. um, having this opportunity for what's called direct award, um, it's working with the customer to actually confirm we understand what the requirement is. We're not given a price. We still have to propose as if we were competing for it, but we have the opportunity since they're negotiating directly with us to ask questions and understand better what their requirements are so that we put together a more realistic bid for them. Wow, uh, <laughs> like that's unbelievable. Kirsty, and, and you're still full on. And at what point, Kirsty, with the with all these pretty busy schedule, you decided to be part of APMP and join APMP as a member? I joined APMP while I was living in Denver in the late 90s. Um, I had heard about the organization. I was actually working on a project uh, just northwest of Denver that where we were um, working to close the site and ultimately wanted to be able to place people in other projects. So I was very much still involved in proposals. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard about the chapter in Denver. So I got involved with it, decided to take a shot at, at a presentation, worked with a colleague of mine and we put together, uh, I put together one, I think it was on oral presentations if I remember right. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked with another colleague about cost proposals um, both got accepted. Uh, the conference was in Colorado Springs and pretty much since I actually helped with the conference coordination and it was through that process that I became more and more engaged with the association and um, the, our original executive director, David Winton, um, folks like David Ball. Um, David was very active in Denver and I actually, I could blame him, but I don't. I, I am grateful to him for giving me the opportunity to step up to the board. Wow. Is Colorado Springs your first uh, Bitcoin? Um, yes. Wow. Okay. That's it. How, from, from that Bitcoin to, I'm sure, the last Bitcoin in Florida, what, what changes, what similarities do you find, uh, Kirsty, all the way through from 1990s to now 2020, 30 years? Um, I continue to be amazed that, that while technology has evolved, Right. The fact of the process that has been generated over these years, the process is really still the key. Mm -hmm. um, the way you get through the process is what I've seen change. You do a lot with online and virtual teams. Um, back in when I first started, you brought your team in, you quarantined them literally for months on end. Um, you didn't release anybody for fear that they would talk to or accidentally say something and a competitor be around. Um, and in today's world, with everything being cloud-based, um, the tools are definitely what, what has evolved, I think, in terms of how you can scrub through an RFP to how you can have online collaboration with teams literally around the world uh, in a much easier environment than it used to be. Is there anything, um, Kirsty, from your experience that actually worked better in the past than what's currently happening now with all the technology and the tools, Kirsty? Um, I would say I, it's all pretty similar still. Um, in fact, when I teach with PTAC, um, I offer a combination of the formats of still using storyboards. Storyboards oh. are still very appropriate for the right opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, those, those simple techniques really haven't changed. Um, 
the review process, the red team review process, the way it's been done for my entire career is still very much the same. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing, um, I wouldn't say it's better. I like the fact now that cost and technical are always integrated. There was a time, when, um, not a time, when I first started, there was a team pulled together for the technical proposal and a team pulled together for the cost proposal and the two did not mix at all to the point you never saw a cost. Um, I can honestly say I never saw a cost proposal probably until the 90s when I started into the nuclear industry. Um, and now to see how they come together much better so that you really do have a technical solution that your price represents. Mm, that's fascinating, um, Kirsty. And uh, at what, at, uh, because you mentioned that you started your journey with, uh, you know, uh, back in 1990s, Kirsty, how was your journey from your first um, being, uh, being the one of the coordinator for Colorado Springs and all the way up to becoming the chair? And your two stints of being the APMP chair, Kirsty, can you share some light into that as well for us? Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, it's a lot of hard work, but the payoff with network, with learning, and again, helping others to grow in this industry, they're really still, other than what APMP and some, a couple other associations offer, it's not like you can get a degree in doing proposals. Nice. Um, and, and I still get asked that question, hey, if I, if I want to do what you're doing, what degree should I go after? And I always tell people, follow my same path, I would strongly recommend. Mm. Find a way into it and then make sure it's what you want. And then there are groups like APMP who can help you further your career. Um, being involved when we got the certification process in place, uh, it was pretty wild being one of the guinea pigs when uh, we put the foundation level test together. Um, mm. And, and looking at how that has evolved to the various levels and the new BD certifications that are coming online. The BD CMMI, um, just again, amazing to see how much impact um, things that we started when I was involved heavily, um, mm -hmm. how they have since evolved and, and have become. I, I look at job descriptions now and it pleases me when I see a PMP certification required. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then probably one of one of the best things, and in fact, he just posted on LinkedIn not too long ago, was the process of going through when um, our former executive director decided it was time for him to resign. Mm -hmm. The process of going out and bringing in a new executive director who really could take the reins and, and grow the organization even further than it had already gone. And watching what Rick has done since then has just been amazing. Yes. So any fond memories in <laughs> selecting Rick and any kind of uh, interesting thing that happened in the process, uh, Kirsty? I, I think probably the most interesting thing was is we went outside the box. Um, we did interview several candidates. Um, though we had several who were very, very much involved in proposals and APMP. Um, and we had a couple, uh, Rick being one of them, who didn't really come grow through the industry like those of us who, who had. Mm. Um, instead, he came from an association executive position. And the more we talked about it as a board, we started realizing maybe that's now's the time to go to somebody who really knows how to manage the reins of an association. We have everything else going. I mean, we had certification going. We had the conferences really growing in capacity. Um, the growth around the world had started. And to bring someone in who really knew what it meant now to manage as an association, um, we think really was what we needed to go find. And finding Rick, uh, who understood that and understood what it meant to take APMP from where it was, which I can't even remember. I think I know it was less than 7,000 to over 10,000 now. Yes. Um, that's what it needed. And I continue to be proud of the fact I was involved in that process. We have five of us on the interview committee. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think I know three for sure. Um, <laughs> And, and all of us, when we finished our, our assessment, we ranked um, independently, then we came together, we talked it through and, and choosing Rick was the right choice. 
Ah, oh, that's so nice. Um, Kasi, and who were the other board colleagues or other members who were part of when you were when you were doing the chair for APMP? And is there any kind of? Uh, I'm sure you all were part of different parts of US. I would assume, um, Kasi. Um, we were. We were from all across the US, and in fact, we we had some of our first board members from from the UK. Um, <laughs> And I apologize, my my memory on names is not all that great. <laughs> <laughs> But folks like Eric Gregory and Betsy Blakeney, Blakely, uh, all right, like me, um, David Bowl. Um, I know I'm forgetting many many others um, that I still talk to every day or talk to online at least uh, through LinkedIn. Um, Karen Shaw. Uh, that we just, we found a way to work together. We came from diverse industries. We came from diverse backgrounds. We literally were from all across the U.S. and England. Um, and it just worked. That's amazing, Kirsty. I think all the kind of seeds that you and others have sowed is what we are slowly trying to reap the benefits of it, actually. So that's great. Uh, and do you still associate yourself with your local APMP chapter? And what's your local APMP chapter, uh, Kirsty? Unfortunately, I do not, um, mostly because I travel extensively. So um, I spend most of my time, if I'm able to, I'll go to a national capital area chapter meeting from time to time. I've, I've spoken um, at one of their capture breakfasts. I've supported the uh, Georgia Chattahoochee SPAC conference a couple of times giving presentations down there. But with my travels, it's just become very difficult. Yes, Kirsty. Yes, I did saw your post in Alaska and other things. So we'll we'll touch some of your travel and other things in the next round, Kirsty. But this is uh, unbelievable, Kirsty. I mean, like you know, from 1990s all the way from APMP where you started to APMP as it is. Um, it's it's brilliant, Kirsty. So uh, over to Ashley. <laughs> All right, Chrissy. So we've learned a lot about your career, and it's been amazing hearing some of those stories. Uh, we have a couple of fun questions for you coming up. Um, so the first one is: Tell me three things that not many people know about you. Most people know this now, but when I started in it, um, many did not. I am an avid cigar smoker. Hmm. Um, I, in fact, have here in my office a very nice humidor with a nice selection of cigars, so anyone who comes to East Tennessee can partake with me. Um, let's see. I think everybody knows I'm already a crazy cat lady. I love my cats. I have seven right now. I've had as many as 11. Um, and probably the most fun one, which, again, a lot of people realize over the years, but it's still something fun to talk about. I collect fetishes. Um, the Zuni Indians carve stone fetishes, and they each um, stone carving represents a different aspect of life and being. And uh, so I have a pretty significant collection of those. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, you mentioned cigars. Can you tell us your three favorite cigars? Now, that's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> the first one is El Rico Habano. Uh, it's very hard to find, um, but I do love it. And when I can find them, it's amazing. Um, the second is um, pretty much anything from a line called My Father Cigars. Um, he makes uh, some very, very nice cigars um, of his La Bijou and probably The Judge, partly because of its name. Um, and then thirdly, I would say is probably going to be um, the Edge. Um, it's um, a series of cigars that he, he makes, um, a Maduro cigar, which is very dark and heavier smoke, um, but very affordable. So those would probably be my top three. Oh, very interesting. So what about um, three places that have cigar-friendly um, pubs or uh, bars? Again, that, uh, I actually have, although I don't keep it up to date much, I do write a blog periodically about once a year uh, <laughs> called Craft Cigar Will Travel. But one of the big things on my page out there, uh, I actually have cigar-friendly bars and cigar-friendly shops, mostly because as a traveling woman traveling by myself, 
Um, cigars has been one of those things that that it's been interesting watching the reaction when I go in to, to purchase. And so all the ones that, are, that I have on my website are ones I've actually stepped foot into. Um, probably the neatest ones is at Frankfurt Airport inside the Sheraton Hotel. And yes, I mean Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. The Sheraton Hotel there has uh, a bar called Havana. And yes, you can purchase Cuban cigars there. Um, Washington, D.C. area has several. My usual hangout is called Basin Street Lounge at 219 King Street in Old Town, Alexandria. Um, and then thirdly, right here in my ne neck of the woods in Knoxville is a neat little pub called Just One More, and the, it is a cigar-friendly bar. Very cool. Okay, so going in a different direction, you're a new addition to the crayon box. What color would you be and why? Purple, because it's my favorite color. I always pick purple or fuchsia as the first two colors when I start coloring. I oh, love it. <laughs> um, what's the most courageous thing you've ever done? Gone to Ghana. Wow. I have actually been to Africa uh, three times. Um, all three have been in the country of Ghana, and it was an amazing experience and one I never envisioned that I'd ever be able to go on. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing trip. Or three times, actually, right? Yes. Um, what is the funniest thing that has happened to you recently? Hmm. That's a good one. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've had a pretty pretty crazy uh, first couple of months here. So um, we've been going nonstop with the proposal world since before Christmas. So it's been yeah. kind of quiet for me. <laughs> okay. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I've actually thought about doing more in the nonprofit world. Uh, running an association, running a nonprofit organization, which I have had the pleasure of doing. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to commit to it full time. So mm. I've often thought my retirement job would be that or potentially going and uh, working for the federal government in their procurement department to kind of walk them through the headache that they give us contractors. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, what was the last gift that you gave someone? Actually, it was just last week and it was a bottle of champagne. Very nice gift. And pizza or salad? Oh, pizza. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Kirsty. That's a quick one. Kirsty, did you say that you love cats? I do. Do you have cat at home, Kirsty? Or uh, I, I actually have seven of them. Oh, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, here is a good one, Kirsty. If you have to ask your cat three questions, what would you those three questions be? Oh, let's see. It depends on which cat I ask. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. I will choose my youngest first, Mystique. Okay. If I could stay home all the time, would you be happy? Oh. Um, my oldest, Jack. Did you used to be a surfer dude in another life? <laughs> and then let's see. Oh, and then my sons. I, I have typically never had an issue with any cat that crosses my doorstep. Um, and I didn't at first with my son's cat when he brought him home, uh, but his cat Pantera, um, unfortunately still holds me accountable for the fact that I took him to the vet to get him neutered. Aww. And since that time, he does not associate with me. And so I would ask him if he really does love me. Aww. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. Uh, thank you, Kirsty. So now coming back to, I'm sure you're already given a lot, think, uh, Kirsty. Who are the people who have been most influential in your life and career so far, uh, Kirsty? First and foremost, my mother and father. Um, 
my father, I swore I would never follow in his footsteps. And one day back in the 90s, I was complaining about a red team. And he asked me what I did. So I told him and he said, you know, you followed in your old man's footsteps. Mm-hmm. No, you're, you're a rocket scientist. He designed rocket fuels for a living. I said, well, you know why I'm here? I said, well, yeah, you're talking to the guy who gives you the money for your research and development. He said, yeah. I submitted a proposal and we're here to give orals on Monday. And I thought to myself, yep, I did follow in his footsteps. And he was my guidance, my counselor, my advisor. The ears when I just needed to rant and rave about proposals and he understood everything I ever talked about. Um, I still talked to him, unfortunately, he passed away in 2004 though. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom always has been a rock uh, Mm -hmm. for me. Um, She's been my mother, my friend. Um, Yes, she used to always yell at me, but to this day, I know I can still go to her and talk to her heart to heart about anything that may be bothering me. And then I would say thirdly is I look back on my career and there really is no one person, Mm -hmm. um, but I have been fortunate to have several mentors over my career. And one in particular uh, was a lady by the name of Maria Witkowski. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was my boss for many years uh, at a company from 2001 until when was it? 2010. She sat me down one day going through my appraisal and helped me realize that if I really wanted to be a leader, Mm -hmm. to look at how I was doing things and how I was treating, how I was working with people and how to obtain the best out of people. And it's one of those times that, that getting the criticism I got opened my eyes up to how I was and how I was acting when I was running proposals. And through that process over the years, I've realized that the best thing I can ever do is let someone do exactly like I did when I started. Mm. Take a chance, try it. It's okay if you fail. We will help you pick back up so that you can move on. Failure is not a loss. Failure means you have an opportunity to learn. And I was so afraid nobody could do as good as I could that I wasn't letting people do what they did well. But once I changed how I was and I started watching them, I have learned so much more over my career. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Looking back, Kirsty, I know you've done so much to APMP, so much for your, you know, 30 plus years, different sectors and uh, other things with lots of traveling and other things, Kirsty. Looking back, what are the f- kind of top three things that you that you are so proud of yourself, Kirsty? Oh, I'm proud of, of being able to continue to help small businesses. Um, that is probably the thing I am, I am most strong about uh, for my career. I've been fortunate when I was with that, that previous company with Maria that I got to learn about working with small businesses. We were very big mm. and we had small business protégés. So I was exposed early in my career to all of that. And now being able to work with organizations like the Procurement Technical Assistance Center and offer guidance and advice that helps other small businesses Uh, develop and grow and be able to succeed themselves. Um, Second, I look back on my first hire and the folks that I've been fortunate to work with now and mentor um, and continue to be proud of the fact that I do enjoy mentoring. Uh, I know there are many times that people look at, at sharing knowledge as being giving up control or giving up your space. And I've learned that the more that I can share and the more that I can give others, the more I get to go do and the more chances I have to do something different. And working with um, the young ladies that that I've got on my team now, for instance, and being able to offer them guidance. I've got one who's taking on a challenge right now. She's not run a proposal of the size I'm handing her. And I know she's going to succeed. 
but I know also she's going to learn a lot on the way, but I'll be there to help her. Um, so it really is the just working and mentoring with others is what I'm most proud of. That's brilliant, Kirsty. So Christy, it sounds like um, you've had an amazing career, you've done some great mentoring, and you have so much knowledge. What is one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? Um, the proposals have to be stressful. Um, and, and I remember so many people think you have to work seven days a week and that you have to work 12 hours a day and that you will always have 24 or seven towards the end. And the with proper organization, with proper planning, really using the tools and, and the processes that have been developed over the decades, um, you can get away from that and make proposals fun and enjoyable and, and teams that want to work together again. That's great and so, so true. Uh, what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? The same advice I give every time I'm giving a talk at PTAC. Uh, Murphy's Law is going to happen. It will. And if you come in with a mindset to try anything, recognize that something is going to fall apart, not happen the way it should have, um, but plan for those scenarios. Um, it's a very worthwhile career. But the big, the other piece with it, as I mentioned, is give it a try. Um, I, I coach young women and young men both. And often I, I, I'm stressing to them, don't say no until you've tried it. I don't like reading and writing still to this day, but what do I do? I read and write every day. Um, and if I had said no to a proofreading editing job because I hated reading and writing so much, I wouldn't be here today. If I had said no to the opportunity to become a business development specialist, if I had said no to the first time I was traveling by myself, um, if I took, didn't go out one night and, and go and enjoy a cigar and actually meet a colleague who we now partner with, um, if I hadn't done those things, I don't think I'd be where I am today. Such great advice. Um, so what's next for you? Oh, I, I'm just enjoying where I am. I've, I'm having the fortune of working with a growing 8 day. Um, and I am looking forward to taking us to the next level. As an Alaska Native corporation, we are able to create new subsidiaries to pursue 8A opportunities. And we've just spun off our first two. We've got two more most likely coming up this year. And I have the ability to drive strategy for all of them. That's very exciting. So Kirsty, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a privilege to have you with us here at Scribble Talk. Wish you all the good health and happiness. Please do continue to inspire our colleagues in bid and proposal industry, Kirsty. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Kirsty. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchuscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays, Pascal Syndrome, signing off. <laughs>